The Aracaceae, otherwise known as the palm family, not to be confused with Aracea, which is the philodendron and arum family that we have uh, are also covering. These are palms, as in big old palm trees. Some characteristics of the Aracaceae, they're monocots. So we expect the parallel leaf fangs, the flower parts in three, the stem is not um, going to differentiate into a thick bark or anything. Uh, often these are large compound leaves on top of a single stem. The leaves are either palmate or pinnate. I will uh, cover that in the next slide. Sometimes there are clusters of stems, uh, but the trees don't branch like an oak tree or some other sort of woody dicot tree, uh, nor do they uh, have a very thick bark. They, they tend to stay fairly thin, thin barked. Uh, some of these uh, members of this family are lianas, which are woody vines that grow in the tropics that uh, start out in the ground, uh, but they climb up trees and get up to the top canopy to compete for light in uh, dense conditions. The roots of these plants are fibrous, like you would expect from monocot. Additionally, uh, many, many, many of them are very water tolerant. You think of them growing next to water or in wet conditions. Additionally, they're salt tolerant, since many are ocean next to oceans and, and saltwater bodies. However, there are some that are very desert adapted, so there's a very wide range of habitats that are um, utilized by this family. The trunks are generally unbranched with no thick bark. The fruit is botanically called a drupe for coconuts, and most of the rest of them it's technically a berry. And they are generally wind pollinated, which translates into meaning they produce lots and lots and lots of pollen. Nothing exotic to attract uh, insects or something uh, to get to them and carry the pollen someplace else. Aracaceae growth forms, you can see two types of leaves there. On the right are what they call palmate leaves. They look very much like a hand with many, many, many fingers. And on the left are pinnate. A feather, the little tiny divisions in a feather are called pinna. And uh, indeed, those uh, leaves on the left look like uh, just great big old leaves, a lot of feathers. On our evolutionary tree, this the Aracales is circled for you. It's again in the monocots, and you can tell where these guys rank in the general scheme of evolutionary um, abilities. The taxonomy of the Aracaceae is a little bit unusual in that the order, the Aracales, it, this is the only family in that order. Generally, orders are groupings of related families. The plants within a family are more related to each other than they are to other families, but nevertheless, plants in one order are more related than plants in another order. In this case, uh, er the Aracaceae is the only family in this order. And they previously were called the Palmaceae. It's, I don't know why they changed it to the Aracaceae, but for today's purposes, this is what we have. Some very interesting sp species in this group. Uh, both economically, agriculturally, and just um, as far as sort of gee wow interesting. The raffia palm is used to produce the fiber. They peel the fiber off of the leaf and make a lot of different products with that. The date palm produces dates, which are a staple of many, many cultures for many thousands of years. The coconut palm, of course, produces a coconut, which not only has coconut and coconut milk for the newest fad in food science, but also that outside husk of the coconut uh, is produces a product called core, C-O-I-R that is used in a lot of different fibrous uh, uses. Then additionally, we have the talipot palm and the coco limer, which I will cover in greater detail in a few minutes here. Here's a picture of the date palm. You can imagine if you had a whole um, uh, plantation of trees producing that much dates per tree, it would be quite an attractive uh, source of fruit and income. There are many, many, many cultivars of these kinds of dates, like apples or grapes, uh, if you start looking around the literature, there's um, uh, such an enormous range, it becomes its own taxonomy in itself. And the differences are very great from, from one type of date to the next. They are uh, harvested at a rate of over 8 tons per 8,000 tons uh, annually, so a lot of dates when you think about how they're eaten in fairly small quantities, and they are eaten. They probably originate in Iran area. They've been a staple in the Middle East and Southern Asia for thousands and thousands of years, uh, long enough that nobody can really trace when they started to begin being used. And so when they went in cultivation, that's equally difficult to, to s 
itself out, but it's, uh, there is evidence that it, it, a good 8,000 years ago these plants were already being uh, planted and intentionally cared for to be harvested for their fruit. They are dioecious, which means the male and the female flowers are on separate plants. So when a plantation is established, it's all female plants, since the males are not going to produce any fruit. They just have a few males to, uh, to, pr to accomplish pollination, or in some cases are even hand pollinated by um, uh, fertile male flowers that are, have been harvested elsewhere. Uh, otherwise, they are wind pollinated. They are not only used for their fruits, they also, the sap is sometimes harvested and dried down for a, a sugar-like product or, um, um, or consumed as a beverage. And then once de-pitted, the, uh, the date nuts, the date seeds, are used uh, as animal feed and sometimes even pressed for oil. The coconut palm is, is uh, similar. Uh, many, many, many people using uh, coconut and coconut products for food sources. And as I already mentioned earlier, that outside husk is, is removed and those fibers used in an enormous variety of products. Um, in my own company, I've used an um, erosion control blanket that you put down on a sloped, recently landscaped, uh, recently um, graded areas. You put a, uh, the seed down and then you put a, a blanket on top that is designed to decompose, but until it does, it holds the soil in place and while the plant's established. And those often have a coconut uh, husk interior that uh, is, is there to, because it's, it's fibrous and tough, but it's also going to biodegrade. Uh, the milk is a unique plant product used in many different recipes, as is the, uh, the actual coconut meat. Coconut oil is pressed out of the meat. The um, uh, physicians of the world are, are uh, not too uh, impressed with this oil because it has a lot of hydrogenated fats in it. However, that very characteristic makes it stable so that under warm conditions, like in the tropics, uh, it, the oil does not go rancid as fast as uh, unhydrogenated oils would, and additionally has a very high cooking temperature. So it has its utilitarian reasons, even if uh, the American Heart Association is not so impressed with it. The oil is also used in soaps and cosmetics, so there's more than just uh, coconut for your um, macaroons that uh, comes from uh, these plants. Now for some interesting, uh, now for something completely different, uh, this coco la mer, which means coconut of the ocean, is uh, La Ladocia maldivica, or Ladocia maldivica, is the largest seed in the world, can weigh up to 65 pounds. And as you can see, those, those people, I kind of like that nerdy guy that's got the one sliced open. Um, they uh, look like they're pretty impressed with the size of that seed. and. Uh, because it's so novel, uh, it has become endangered. The sale is now, um, sale and trade is restricted. However, there's still a black market in these plants, and so they are still under threat. The reason they've been over-harvested is just the tourist novelty of having these plants. And uh, additionally, they're made into boxes and umbrella stands and a variety of different uh, unusual structures, and uh, they have the additional misfortune that uh, in a large range of cultures, they are considered that the meat of this um, fruit is an aphrodisiac, and so that is uh, what still leads to the black market trading, uh, remarkably high prices for a slice of, of uh, coco la mer droop. And um, they're additionally uh, threatened by invasive species and fire. Uh, palm trees are, are remarkably flammable in, uh, uh, if they're not uh, routinely burned with prescribed fire or uh, wildfire. They can uh, develop a huge fuel load and then when they um, do burn, they, the fire is hot enough and intense enough that it kills them rather than just sort of cleaning up the last year's or last few years worth of um, dead palm fronds. So fire is an additional threat. And uh, these plants were originally only, only found on two islands in the Seychelles Islands, which are over north of Madagascar, off of the um, African coast. And now apparently only two native populations remain. There are, of course, because they're so novel, some in cultivation in you know, different botanical uh, arboreta around the world, but uh, they are definitely very endangered. We can hope that some conservationists someplace are trying hard to uh, keep these uh, from going extinct. Another G-Wow, the talipot palm, is, uh, has the largest inflorescence that uh, anybody has ever documented. 
Now, we can remember the Titan Aram from the Araceae family had the largest unbranched fluoresc inflorescence. Uh, well, inflorescence is um, a group of flowers and um, in a cluster so that any, a non-botanist would call it just one flower, but it's actually a cluster of flowers. So in the Titan Aram, that uh, large internal spadex is actually many, many, many tiny little flowers grouped together. In this case, these huge fronds, that one frond, one arm of this inflorescence could be you know, as much as 10 foot long and 3 foot wide. Uh, the overall inflorescence contains millions of individual flowers. And I chose these pictures because you can get some perspective on them. In the uh, right-hand picture, the people at the, there are people at the bottom, so you can get an idea of how large that actually is by looking at how large the people are in the same photograph. And the photograph on the left, it looks like a, like a two-story um, house of some sort is in the background. So again, you can get some idea how large this inflorescence actually is. So these, these four trees, they spend 30 to 50 years growing, and then they, they produce this inflorescence, which you can imagine would take an enormous um, amount of resources out of the plant, and then the plant dies after flowering. However, if you have a million or more flowers, and say even half of those produce a fruit, you're going to produce a lot of seeds, and so there's great opportunity for offspring to carry on that particular genetic line. So that is the talipot. The raffia palm is another economically interesting plant. In addition to having um, an, a G-Wow, uh, it has the largest single leaf in the world. The picture of the plant on the upper left has a man standing in the bottom of it, and so you can get some perspective on how large this uh, individual, and this of course would be a pinnate leaf, is. They've been measured as long as 81 feet and 10 feet wide, so um, a big old whopping leaf. And uh, people have learned how to sort of pull the bottom layer of those fronds off and create uh, what they call raffia, which you can see in the lower right, the, the sort of raw raffia ready to be made into something. And indeed, it's made into an almost you know, unlimited range of products, and hats and coats and purses and, and um, uh, rugs. Ralph Lauren has a line of raffia. There's raffia chairs. There's raffia tables. Uh, it goes on uh, sort of forever. Um, this is not Wikia, and then that's also not a Panama hat. That, that's a different plant that uh, is used to make Panama hats. So um, uh, an interesting plant uh, on several levels. Uh, let's see, toxicity. This, this plant family doesn't seem to be too dangerous. There are a few people who are allergic to coconut. Uh, there are some who get allergies. And when plants like this that produce a lot of pollen because they are wind pollinated uh, tend to just because of the mass of pollen they put out uh, sometimes uh, cause uh, allergies in sensitive people. And some people that handle the plants a lot, whether they're harvesting coconuts and working with that core or the raffia, can get some dermal um, irritations, but uh, nothing, nothing too serious. If you'd like more information, there's plenty of it out there. Of course, there's Wikipedia. There's a, a large website just about raffia. There's a couple general um, scholarly type, a little bit about everything sites, and then additionally there is an International Palm Society. So that concludes the Eraceae.